I have eight random questions here. You get three rolls on the tower and whatever I roll for you, that is where our conversation begins. My goodness, okay. Can you give me one audition high, but then also tell me one audition low and what you learned from it that you were able to apply to future auditions? Uh, okay, so one audition high. Uh, well, many the auditions when you go in and you nail it and you come out and then as you're driving away, your agent calls and you're like, yes, because they never call to say, really, how did it go? They're calling because casting has already called. So my worst audition moment, it was a callback with, uh, for a comedy with Lisa Kudrow. And I was so excited and it was such a long time ago and I was really, really excited. And I was very nervous. I got very, very nervous. And I did my shtick, I did the scene. And as I went to walk out of the room, I walked into the wall <laughs> because I was so nervous. And I walked into the wall and they thought it was part of my shtick, my comedy routine, but it was actually me. And then I played it like, walking through the wall. And then I sort of walked out and I was like, oh my God, where's the door? I couldn't get out of there fast enough. So I'm calling this one mine. So you, as in real you, you're in a yellow jacket situation. You are on a plane, it goes down in the wilderness, but you managed to find your suitcase. What is something in that suitcase that could help everybody, but you don't want to share it and you keep it secret so you could have it all to yourself? I love your mind. Oh, well, the obvious choice is, you know, is food and beverages, um, hydration, vitamins. Um, what would be the thing I'd be like, I'm not sharing? You're giving smart answers. My thing is toothpaste because I'm like neurotic with my teeth. And like, what happens when we run out of toothpaste? I want to be able to ration mine myself. You just have to really like get the corner of a towel and scrub your teeth. I think, yeah, no, I would, I would definitely be hoarding my vitamins and any of my personal products, even a good moisturizer, because I'm imagining your skin goes quite dry in the wilderness. Um, yeah, I think all my... Yeah, I think I, I do. When I come to Los Angeles, I always do buy lots of uh, protein bars. So I think they might be in my suitcase. So I, I'm going to hoard those. If you could have one burning question for the future of the show or what has happened in between the 90s and the present day material, and you could ask the showrunners and get a legitimate answer to it, what question would you pose to them? Well, I think the question really is once they're rescued, don't you think? The fallout, and I, and I think they'll show that. I think they'll write that. I'm hoping that's a season. I think it's the once they're rescued, what the response is from everybody. Like, you know, the, the kind of, what is the word when you're coming back in? The re-entry. The re-entry into society is the timeline I really want to see. Um, and I and I also think for Lottie we got we got a little moment of, of Lottie's re-entry and it didn't go so well. Hello everyone, welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night. Yet another Yellow Jackets edition of Ladies Night because I can't stop. Simone Kessel, welcome to the show. Congratulations on Yellow Jackets. And I just can't wait to overwhelm you with all of my obnoxiously specific theory type questions right now. Oh, I hope I can answer them all. Thank you so much for having me. You get that itch. You want to be an actor. At the time, what did you think step one was to becoming a professional actor? And now having done it, would you recommend that step to another aspiring actor? Or did you find something that was more effective along the way? I wish there were magical steps that you could go at number one or number two, and then you will get to step 10. However, um, I think I think just doing the work is really vital and, and really important and not being uh, trapped in the world of what you imagine fame is going to be like and what it's going to do because it's so accessible now that we have social media and, you know, we can, we can do this. So I think you've got to take the idea of fame and your expectations out and just stay on your path and do the job in front of you. And whether that's auditioning, whether that's just reading, whether that's um, working out or whether that's doing classes, whatever it is, you have to, they're the steps. And I wish somebody had said, just keep going with that more because you get a bit lost along the way. I think when you're, when you're a young actress and, and you're like, am, am I good enough? 
that's the other thing, you know, do I look right? Am I, am I the right person? And what I do realize now, which I wish I'd said to my younger self was it's not personal. It's not about you. It's not, you know, it's if you're right for the role and, uh, and just trust, trust the process. And if you love it enough, you'll get there. And each audition is one step closer to getting the, the dream role. As uh, someone who is a mighty sensitive individual, the audition process when you're an actor is one of the the many things about the craft that just, like, it doesn't even just blow my, like, I can't fully wrap my mind around how you do that so often, but but it's, it's part, someone once told me that they had to start considering um, auditions as, as like the job, like not looking if they're going to book the job, but the, the audition itself being the job. And that way, no matter what happens, you leave with some sense of closure and satisfaction. That's exactly right. And that's what I do after each audition. I put the sides in the bin and I walk out of there and I did, and I say, I've done my job, you know, and ob- obviously you, re- you really want the result to happen if it's a role you really want. But I think being an actor is 90% the prep and the audition and and getting through that. And then the rest is playing, but you've got to really do your work. And I and I say my advice is to, to actors, know your lines, drill them, drill them so that you can just throw them away so that anything that happens in the audition, you're ready, you know, you're ready to go. And I think, that, and, and then when you get over your nerves, use your nerves in a way that you can channel something as well. There's so many techniques and that's why I think doing classes is vital learning it's like going to the gym you can't just do one class in boxing and then call yourself a boxer you know you have to keep doing it so yeah that's that's my advice because then you get over the nerves because you've done the work so you can be more present you know and don't create the expectation of what you think this role is going to bring to your life because then that, that takes the nerves away. Just do the job. So I did want to talk a little bit about making the move from the New Zealand film industry to Hollywood. I have, I have many questions about that. First, when you did make that leap, was it a deliberate choice where you said to yourself, like, now is the time that I want to start doing Hollywood projects? Or did something just kind of come up and get that started? Well, I think for, for most actors in Australia and New Zealand, the big calling card is always pilot season. It gives you three months of going to Los Angeles, getting a manager usually, depending on what work you have behind you. And then you get to Los Angeles and you do pilot season. Pilot season doesn't really exist as as much as it used to. It was kind of like you fly in in January, you audition, see what happens, and then you're out by March. So that was always something that I would come over for and uh, be prepared for and hope for. And then if it doesn't sort of happen, then it's very difficult getting a visa and the whole process of of getting a visa unless you're sponsored on a job. So you kind of come and you, you throw everything at the wall and hope something will stick. And then if it doesn't, you come back and then you go the following year. Um, So that's really what that was about. And then also a lot of productions are filmed down here as well. So that's a great opportunity to kind of meet people from the U S and say like, Hey, hi. And, you know, I started out when I was very, very young on a show called Xena and Hercules in, a, in a, yeah, in New Zealand. And I was like, I was so young. I think I was 16 and, you know, working with Kevin Sorbo and people like that and the beautiful Lucy Lawless. And, you know, you got to, you got to kind of really learn the, the accent, working with, on an American set, those things. And so eventually you kind of, you fall into line. And there's so many amazing Australian and New Zealand actors in Los Angeles, in, in Hollywood. And um, yeah, it's just- You got a couple on your show. <laughs> got a couple on my show. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's four of us. There's, there's Liv, Melanie, Courtney, and myself, yeah. You got the opportunity to learn a little bit about the Hollywood system and the way of uh, doing production that way via sets like that. But I'm kind of curious about the opposite because I'm a little obsessed with the vibe that I hear exists on most sets in New Zealand. And I don't know, it just seems like you're doing things there that would benefit any set in any part of the world. So what is something specific to the way you shoot a New Zealand production that you think would benefit another set somewhere else if they adopted and used in their production process as well? Well, there's less people and there's less unions. So if I'm on set and somebody's like, oh, we need to like move this over here, I as the actress would be like, coming. And I, ha- you know, we all help each other. It's so lovely. There's no, the world of trailers, we don't have you know, trailers like that. We all have one big trailer, a green room, which we all sit in and we laugh our heads off and that's it. You have no personal 
dressing room in New Zealand. So everything is way so much more. It, it's just, it's not as flash and showy. You know, there's just, we don't have crafties. We have a tin of biscuits and a cup of tea, you know, like that's so, so even to this day, when I go on big American sets, I'm like, when I look at crafties and I've, I've said this before, I always go and I'm like, and the little Maori New Zealand girl in me goes, and it's for free. <laughs> I don't have to pay and I can order anything I want, you know, like, because in New Zealand, seriously, it's like, oh, wait for lunch. Lunch is in a few hours, then you get something to eat. <laughs> but it, it's really lovely. And that's kind of like, there's no show pony. There's no hierarchy. Everyone's there to do a job. And I recently did a film, well, I guess now two years ago in, in New Zealand called Muru and it was a Māori film. And it was just with Cliff Curtis and, it was just so wonderful at lunchtime. They brought out the guitar and everyone's singing in the local mud eye where we were filming, made a big lunch and we had karakia and prayer and seafood. And it was just, it was wonderful. So that's the difference. There's a very, it's, it's just a lot smaller and there's a lot less money, but you're doing it because you love what you're doing. I had the opportunity to see that at TIFF. The fact that you were all able to do with less money what other productions do with significant budgets is is really something else that should be recognized. Right, and, and, and Mudu, I'm going to say the budget on that was like five million. Like if that- It is a full-blown action movie. <laughs> no, like some of the stunt work you all do in that looks like it would require far more. Right, and so, and that's it. And you do it, it was such a joy to make. And it's it's just so different. And Australia is very similar. You know, there's, it, everything is very small here as well, unless it's an American production that's come over. So you really you really learn to be very grateful in in both worlds. And you're much closer to your crew I would say in Australia and New Zealand, and I really like that because I I love crews and I love I love the work ethic and being on set and and all being such a family for an intense short of time. So yeah, that's and and look again on the like say on Yellow Jackets, it was a huge crew and many units, and you don't become as close to your crew, but um, you definitely get that opportunity here, and so I think that's a good grounding as an actor moving into the world of, of Hollywood. Let us jump into Yellow Jackets Fall Force because I have a million questions. Um, first question, what would you say is the biggest difference between how you pictured Lottie day one when you booked the role and then who she became the more you prepped and dug into the character? I didn't know that the arc of her mental health would be what it was, you know? And so um, I came into Lottie really in the power of being this this beautiful, gracious, social, spiritual healer. And then where she ends up is just huge. And I, I think around episode maybe five or six, I was started to understand the decline, so to speak, or the fact that she really falls apart. Um, and even watching it now, and I'm kind of stunned too, because when you're in it, you're so in it. And... And I have to say that last episode, it broke my heart. It broke my heart for obviously for the Natalie moment, but it broke my heart to see Lottie so traumatized and broken and really in that, you know, she's in a, she's in a state, she's in an absolute state. And so when I watched that, I was, I was kind of really taken with where I went and it, you know, it makes me kind of like, it just makes me so much more um, compassionate and understanding for people who are going through mental health and 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 being true to that, you know. And watching it back, I don't recognise myself in that at all. And um, I guess that's the job of the actor. But, um, yeah, so understanding where she started, this glorious, you know, golden healer to this absolutely broken woman was is ex pretty extreme. I will say though, something you like teased but didn't full fully tell me truthfully at the junket. It it was something it was something like she has a heart of gold or her intentions are pure. Even where things ended up, I like I believe that that is true from start to finish. Her intentions remain pure from beginning to end. It's just her mentality and her way of going about yes. it changes. So many people are like, she's the bad, she's the bad one, she's going to, but she wasn't, her intentions are pure. And 
she just gets lost along the way because of her mental health and the and PTSD and obviously what's happened to all of them. And and that's just such a sort of clever way of, of peppering it in along the way. You and Courtney do a beautiful job with that. Just the the whole, I love the whole idea too of, I think the, the line in the show is like, like she's like this because like we did this and the way that you two reflect that, but also the fact that all she ever wants to do is is help everybody. She just, wants, she just wants to help and she's learning along the way. So how can you not sort of feel for that character? You know, so my heart crumbles my, for her yeah. <laughs> over and over and over again. Beautiful job. And I think it was that too. Like, you know, I never get to see what Courtney's doing until the final cut. So seeing if that, that lines up, you know, that's a really difficult thing, playing, there's two people playing the same role just on a different timeline. Um, so seeing that and seeing if it, if it works, those two timelines, and it, and it really does, you know, and seeing she's very still. And I think um, I sort of played her a lot more, you know, with a lot more sort of facial expressions and, and more broken, but very sort of tactile and, so that's really that's a really interesting space, but um, yeah, no, Courtney did a lovely job. I've spoken to quite a few of you at this point, and I know that you all have different approaches and and kind of mentalities about the not knowing of playing these characters while working on the show, like not knowing what finally happened in the '90s timeline, not knowing what their time in between timelines was like. So, what is your approach to all of that? Are you the type of actor who wants to press the showrunners with uh, with questions to get more information, or do you kind of just you know let it go and and do what you could do in the moment and I don't know. I guess hope it aligns ultimately in the end. Well, I think, yeah, hope it aligns. I started when I came in, I was, I came in hot with questions like you did at the junction, junket. You came in hot. I was like, wow, she's amazing. Knows what she I wasn't wasting any time. Yeah, you weren't wasting any time because you were going to room to room and we were all sitting there and you came and I was like, oh my God, she's smart. She's funny. And she's giving it to us, you know? And so, um, but which is great, which is really great. Um, but yeah, with the showrunners, I purpose at the beginning, I was very kind of like, so tell me, tell me, tell me. And they don't give a lot at all. And so I sort of realized that. So I stood back and I thought, you know what? Be like Lottie, trust the process. And so what I was learning playing Lottie, I was bringing into my personal life of just let it go. It's all it's all going to work out. It's all going to land perfectly. And it, and it did, you know. So I would, oh, I would have loved to have asked them, but I didn't want to be there. That needy actress, please, sir, can I have some more? <laughs> well, who, who is? Who's the, who is the one who asks the most questions that you all know that you could go to when you want, like, little secrets about what's to come? Well, I think, I think Tawny is amazing because she, she seems to know what's happening all the time and she's so cool with it. So Tawny sort of seems to know. Christina seems to know as well. Um, I think Lauren asks the big questions and yeah, I think those three sort of seem to know what's going on a lot more than, well, myself, I can't speak for Melanie, but, um, yeah, they're, they're across it. They're, they're power. I'm fi filing this all the way for the season three junket. Good. Now, <laughs> I know, now I know, now I know who to go after for details. And, um, and I'll say, wow, where did you get that from? And you go, well, actually, Simone. <laughs> So I will preface this next question by saying like, none of this has to be canon. It is just for you and your own headspace when playing this character. But is there any specific element of her story where like you had to come up with the backstory in order to play the moment and make her experience feel full, even if that backstory element is not something that holds true later on? Yeah, I think all of those choices, because I haven't, I had no background on where Lottie had been and what had happened and why she suddenly has this glorious cult following and she lives on this, you know, community that is rich with living off the land and everything. So I sort of had to join my own dots in my head. And um, and for a lot of those scenes as well, she's, you know, she's, she's giving a lot. There were a few scenes cut um, of all her sermons, I'm going to call them, um, which is a shame, but I guess you get it. You know, she's delivering love and peace and, and wants everyone to heal through past trauma. So I, I sort of had to fill in the dots of who her gurus were, who her teachings were from. So I kind of, I did my homework on that. And I remember when I was very young, I, 
I was obsessed with Louise Hay. I don't know if you remember, know who she is, but she was, I don't think so. it was all affirmations and visualizing, you know, I love and approve of myself. She's that. And uh, so I went back and I found my Louise Hay books and I really sort of dug into those again. And that's a lovely place to be in, you know, um, and, and just finding why she cares so much. And that was one of my questions to the showrunners. Does she genuinely want to help people? And they were like, absolutely she does. So with that little, little note, I could then create what you then saw, you know, because I came from truth then. But if I thought she was just kind of doing it for money as a bit of a side hustle, then I'd be like, mm. but no, she's, she's true. Congratulations on Yellow Jackets, but also everything you've accomplished. You are welcome back to Collider Ladies Night anytime you want. Thank you so much for having me.